Morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the, the third in a four part series of um, virtual pulse meetings with PGRO and Syngenta. Uh, my name's Rebecca Stilton, and I'll be hosting the meeting this morning. Um, so I'll be facilitating the, the questions with our presenters um, as we go through. So this morning, we're going to hear from um, Leah Herald from PGRO. Um, on disease control in field beans. Um, and then we will hear from Michael Tate from Syngenta. Um, and he's going to talk to us about a, a new product offer that's, that's coming through. So just a couple of um, housekeeping rules um, and suggestions for people. So we are recording this webinar. Um, and this webinar will then be published on the Syngenta YouTube channel, um, as well as the PGRO website. Um, so we would request that people don't record this by any other means because it will be available um, on those two channels. If you wish to ask a question, um, which we would thoroughly encourage, then we please ask you to use the Q&A function um, of Zoom, which you will find at the bottom of your screen if you hover your mouse um, over there, you'll get a, a, a menu bar come up to so just type something in the q a um, and i'll facilitate asking those questions to Leah and michael at the end after the event um, you will receive an email which will be in your inboxes tomorrow um, where you'll be able to apply for your basis and neuroso points um, as well as a link to a, a feedback survey which we'd be grateful if you could um, fill in to help us shape these meetings going forwards so without further ado, um, I will ask Leia to take over the, the share of the screen um, and present her slides on disease control in field beans. Perfect, thank you, Leia. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. I will start today's presentations for giving, with giving you an overview about the most common diseases in field beans, their risk factors and potential ways to control them. One of the most common diseases in field beans is chocolate spot. Chocolate spot is characterized by these small chocolate colored lesions that uh, appear on the surface of the leaf. And under severe cases, chocolate spot can lead to up to 50% yield loss. Another very common disease is bean rust. Bean rust are these red, kind of brown red pustules that appear on the leaves and then very quickly can cover the whole leaf surface. Um, under severe cases, rust can lead up to 70% um, yield losses. A slightly less common disease, but still um, uh, very important, is bean downy mildew. Bean downy mildew, these are these big lesions kind of pale on the upper side of the leaves and on the underside of the leaves, there's this white gray mycelium and under severe cases, it can lead up to 30% yield loss. Aspokaita is an increasingly rare disease. The reason that I'm going to mention it in this presentation is that it is very difficult to distinguish from Sarcospora, which is another bean disease, but we come back to this a little bit later. And the last disease that I'm going to talk about is foot rot, Foot rot is a soil-borne disease that affects the roots and the lower stem of the plants. And its occurrence is soil-dependent and soil-condition-dependent. In 2020, we had a really bad bean foot rot year. But to start with, we talk about chocolate spot. Chocolate spot is caused by the um, pathogens Botrytis fabi and Botrytis cinerea. It usually occurs from May onwards under cool and wet conditions. And generally speaking, winter beans are more susceptible than spring beans. On the right hand side, you can see a graph from an experiment that we did a few years ago. And as you can see on the x axis, is the plants per square meter. And the denser the population, the higher the chocolate spot infection in the crop. Not only this, the top line, the crop was sown on the 4th of October, the bottom, the 23rd of November. And you can see the earlier sown crop had a lot higher infection levels than the later sown crop. So we can say that early drilling in winter beans and dense crop increase the risk of chocolate spot. And this is due to the microclimate, the humidity that develops in dense crops. With regards to crop protection, 
Control is essential when conditions are suitable for disease. And this is a graph on the right hand side from an experiment a few years back, where we tried different spray timings. So the early spray went on at early flower, mid was mid flower, which coincides with the first pots on the lower trusses just showing. The late spray went on late flower, so about three weeks after the mid flower one. And with the green bars, you can see every time when a mid spray, so T1 at mid flower first pot went on, then chocolate spot infection was the lowest and the corresponding yields were the highest. And over the last years, every time, if we see a timing response to chocolate spot, then the mid flower first pot timing is the one that gives the best response. And then we recommend to follow it up three to four weeks later um, with a spray that mainly uh, aims to um, control bean rust. Currently improved actives to control chocolate spot are azoxystrobin, boscalate and pyroclostrobin, saprodinyl and fluoroxynil, metconazole and tabuconazole. Another disease is bean rust caused by Euromyces vicia fave. This is a later disease, a warm weather disease that normally occurs from June onwards. And disease can develop very quickly if we have hot days and cool humid nights. So from the first postule showing on the leaf to a complete coverage of the plant, this can happen within just a few days. And because we had quite hot Junes over the last few years, this is why rust was probably the dominant disease over the last few years in field beans. As my colleague Steve mentioned in his presentation on Monday, there are some varietal resistance differences in spring bean varieties. So these, this information is now for the first time on our descriptive list, and this is based on four trials that were carried out in 2020. And you can see the higher the number, the greater the resistance to rust, and there are some differences. This uh, um, data that we will now collect every year as part of the descriptive list trials. So the data will get stronger and will give us a really good idea which varieties might um, be able to cope better with rust pressure than others. Bean rust control is absolutely essential when conditions are suitable for disease development. In the picture, you can see on the right hand side, you can just make out the canes from our trial. And the farmers um, switched off the whole boom of the sprayer when passing the trial. So the left hand side of the tram line wasn't sprayed. And you can see the rust has completely overcome the crop, um, complete defoliation, um, very different to the green part, the rest of the field. As I said before, the spray timing is the end of flowering. And currently um, approved actives that work well with regards to rust are azoxystrobin, metconazole, and tabuconazole. A third disease to mention is bean downy mildew caused by Peronospora vicia. It's an earlier disease. It is favored by cool and humid conditions and occurs mainly in spring beans in, uh, from about late spring onwards. Terra runs the crop monitor site and from April onwards on this site, you will find which regions in the UK are under, um, currently under the greatest risk of spring bean um, downy mildew development. So you can check your region to see whether you need to keep an eye on whether the disease develops. We recommend to spray when the disease is present on 25% of the plants. And there's a straight Matilaxyl M product, SL567A, that has an EMO for spring beans and works really well with controlling downy mildew. This slide is not important for field beans because we don't have any seed treatments, but because I've mentioned metal axilema, I really wanted to make sure that we bring this information across because it is very important when you're growing vining peas or broad beans. The decision isn't final, but all of the information that Syngenta has so far from CID points that the use of seed treated with metal axil M will be restricted to indoor use only from the 1st of June this year. And this also applies to imported seed, which means if you have any seed that is treated with any metal axil M containing product, you will not be able to plant it outdoors after May 2021. 
Back to uh, beam down medium, same as with um, the rust slide, there are big differences in the varieties and these data have been part of the descriptive list for years and are tested every year. And you can see there are some varieties like Lynx and Yukon that have a very high resistance rating of eight. So it is much uh, more likely that you won't be um, needed a downy mildew spray if you're growing one of these varieties because they, their resistance is uh, quite high. As I mentioned before, another disease uh, or a couple of diseases are Ascochyta and Cercospora. And the reason that I'm mentioning is that they are basically indistinguishable in the field. On the left hand side, there's two pictures of Cercospora zonata and field beans. On the right hand side, Ascochyta fabe. And you can see both of them lead to round lesions with circuit, um, circuit cycles in the middle and then um, a, a pale kind of center of the lesion. They both are more likely to occur in winter beans from winter onwards. Um, as you, most of you will probably know, PJO runs a free crop clinic. And I would highly recommend if you see any lesions like this in your crops, that you send us a few bean samples and we then try to extract spores because the spores between these species differ. And then we are hopefully able to tell you whether you have Ascochyta fabia or Cercospora in your crop. The reason that this is important is that Ascochyta is a seed-borne disease, whereas Cercospora is not. So seed-borne disease means if the plant is infected, it will transfer it into the seed and the seed will become infected. This is, this is why it's important if you have farm-safe seed that you get your seeds tested, whether Ascochyta is present. There are several <coughs> seed laboratories um, that offer the self, a test, for example, PJO um, offers the test as well, and we will then tell you whether Ascochyta infection is in the seed or not. Certified seed is regularly tested, and we very rarely see Ascochyta in bean seeds. I think we had two positive samples in the last five years or something like this, which shows how successful this screening program has been, because all of the beans are tested regularly. There's hardly any Ascochyta in seeds stocks left. And this is why we basically never see it in the field anymore. And this is why we say that foliar sprays are rarely justified in recent years. If you have Ascochyta present, then a full right um, application of Amistar will control it. Tepuconazole will control Cercospora, but is rarely needed because crops often outgrow the disease. So we say only to apply um, a spray if you have very high levels of Cercospora present early on in the crop. The last disease to talk about is foot rot. Foot rot is a soil borne disease and the two main pathogens causing it are Fusarium culmorum and Fusarium solani, but there's indication that there's more um, Fusarium species potentially involved in this. Fusarium culmorum is also common in wheat and sugar beet and Fusarium solani is pathogenic on peas. It is important to note though that under normal circumstances, these um, pathogen isolates are host specific, which means that if the Fusarium culmorum that infects wheat would not affect beans or vice versa. Foot rot leads to rottening of the roots and the stem and the Resiliella mitch larvae takes advantage of it. It feeds on the decaying tissue. The larvae itself does not cause any harm to the plant. But if you find these brightly orange colored um, larvae in your bean crop, then this is a good indication that your plants might be infected by foot rots. As I said before, soil borne disease, so they survive as long lasting resting spores in soils. Currently, we don't have any soil tests available to assess the pathogen levels in soil, but this is something that we are hoping to be able to work on over the next years and at some point, hopefully be able to offer. Foot rot infection is encouraged in stressed plants. So anything that stresses the plants like water logging or compaction helps the disease to take hold. Because there are no chemical controls available, the only thing you can do is to lengthen rotations, to avoid soil compaction and to encourage healthy soils. The picture on the right is a picture that I took at one of the field visits this year. And if, as you can see, if you have soil conditions like this, the pathogens will be very grateful, the plants not so much. 
And just to finish off, these are my contact details. Just to mention, there's lots of information that you can find on our uh, website as well. I already mentioned the crop clinic and remember the advice is free. So any questions, please give us a call. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, so we've had a few questions come through already, which is brilliant. Um, we will get to those at the end of the, the presentation. So please keep those coming in. Um, and now we'll, um, we'll hand over to Michael Tate, um, who's going to talk to us about a, a product that's being registered um, for field beans by Syngenta. Thank you, Michael. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the event. Uh, my name is Michael Tate, and I'm the technical manager who provides technical support for uh, products, our vegetable products, and also for potatoes. And I want to talk to you a bit this morning about uh, a new product that we've got coming through the pipeline. We don't have approval at the moment, but at the best estimate, we are expecting approval in time for uh, the coming season. So we thought it was worthwhile to alert you to this and to give you some background so that assuming that we are correct and we have this in time for the season, you'll be well informed about how to use the material. Let's just see about moving the screen. So the product is based on a combination of salatinol and prothiaconazole and um, we are we have applied for only one application per crop. This product is a sort of a replacer for what was used a few years ago, Alto Elite. That had two applications, but we know that we're only, well, we only applied for one application in this crop. You can see there that we're looking for um, use in field beans and combining peas, uh, along with chickpeas, lentils, and at some stage, linseed and flax. And the, on the side there, you can see the application windows that we've requested, and we're obviously hopeful that that is what um, CRD will grant us. Leah has very comprehensively covered the key diseases that affect um, field beans. So I'm not going to go into great detail on those, but the important diseases that we expect to get on the label would be chocolate spot, ascochyta, and bean rust. In the sort of following presentation about the product, I'm not going to say uh, anything about Ascochyta because um, as you heard from Leah, it's not particularly common at the moment. So I'm going to concentrate on trials work that we did last year where we got some results on chocolate spot and um, very good results on bean rust. So I'll, I'll give you those in just a minute. I think it's useful to start off with though, with a bit of information about how rust behaves, because as Leah mentioned, it has been the predominant disease in the last few seasons, and also then how this affects how um, our new product based on salatinol and prothiaconazole works. So just to start off with, on the left side, you've got a rust spore, and on the right side there, you've got a picture of the rust spore actually starting to penetrate the leaf of a bean. And the, through these sections, you can see how the mycelium develops within the leaf structure. On the, le on the left hand side, you've got sort of seven days uh, post the infection. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you can see it's developed quite a bit by the 14 day period. If we then go forward a little bit, you can see that after a while, uh, the entire leaf mass is being infected by the, um, the bean rust and then new spores are starting to be uh, produced on the surface to reinfect other leaves or indeed neighboring crops. So once the uh, disease gets going, it is causing a great deal of damage to leaf structure, as you can see. Now, just to give you a bit of an idea about how um, the salatinol based product works. So on the left, again, you've got an untreated spore and on the right, you've got a spore where treatment occurred within one day of infection. So there is very limited, or there is some um, curative activity from the product. But the main way that it works, as you'll see, is as a preventative material. So timing and getting in before rust becomes established will be important when you come to use the product uh, in the season. So on the left here, you can see, um, again, a section where rust has got established within the leaf structure. 
And on the right hand photograph, you've got a picture where selatinol was applied, but it wasn't applied until uh, a bit too late. So some disease has managed to get in uh, into the leaf structure. So again, it comes back to the importance of timing, um, preventative timing in order to optimize the activity that you will get from this product when we get the approval. And you can see here, just for example, on the left-hand side, you've got rust widely established within the leaf structure, causing a great deal of damage. Or on the right-hand side, you've got a leaf section where selatinol was used preventatively, and you've got it completely free of rust, although it was under the same disease pressure as the leaf on the, uh, on the left-hand side. So I think that's just showing you to illustrate uh, a little bit about how rust develops and also just to get you a bit of a feel for how we see the product being used uh, when we get it approved. And of course, this is the sort of thing we see in the field. On the left hand side there, you've got an untreated um, plot with quite extensive rust developing. And again, Leah showed you some other dramatic pictures of the damage the disease can cause. And on the right hand side, you've got the new selatinol based products applied at T1, the timing that um, again, Leah was talking about earlier on, and that's followed at T2 by an Amistar application. So again, a nice clean crop where you've got that approach of uh, keeping the rust out of the crop in the first place. Now, last year, we ran a number of trials with PGRO and some in-house. And I just wanted to try to explain to you a little bit about what we were trying to learn from those trials. So I'll just try and get my pointer to work. This box up here shows you where we did early applications. I've called it early because the first timing was what we call a tier half and the second timing was at T1.5. You will see here that we've used our new product at a number of rates. The anticipated approved rate, a 0.5 litre rate and a 0.4 litre rate because we wanted to explore two things. One was the effect of rate and two, the effect of timing of the product. And in all cases, you can see that we follow the second application in all cases is Amistar at three quarters of a litre. This is, although I've called this late, this is more, probably should have been called standard time. We've got a standard T1 and T2 timing that uh, Leah also mentioned in her talk earlier on. And again, we've got the three different rates of our product in there. So this was the sort of setup for the trial that we did for the winter bean work. And I'll show you a few experiments where that's been carried out. Okay, just emphasizing the timing. Um, obviously the tier half would have been earlier T1.5 would have been in between, but I thought it made it a bit too messy to put all the timings on there. This is the first trial I was going to talk about. This was a trial that PGRO ran for us at Nubra. Here you've got the different timings across the bottom from the tier half through to the standard T2 timings, the dates and the growth stages of the crop. Uh, our original aim was to try and get bean, uh, sorry, try and get chocolate spot in both trials. But to be honest, last year, it was mostly a rust year, but we have got some chocolate spot data all the same. Now here in the trial, we did a comparison with um, two doses of Signum, and that was at a standard T1 and T2 timing. Here you've got the early applications, T1.5 and 1.5, and you've got the different rates of our uh, new product in there. And here you've got the t standard T1, T2 timings again with the three different rates. And you'll see that all of them have worked well, but all of them, all of these selatinol prothioconazole based treatments have outperformed uh, two doses of Signum for uh, rust control in this winter bean crop. We also had some chocolate spot at the same site, but not a very great deal of disease. You can see here the level of disease in the untreated was not very high and all of the treatments gave an effect and we couldn't in this particular trial make any uh, distinction in technical terms between these treatments or the timings. But we did show significantly re a significant reduction in disease compared with the untreated. This is the yield from those sites. Again, the treatments out yielded the untreated but we weren't able in this particular trial to um, differentiate between the different treatments because the disease pressure um, was relatively 
uh, relatively low from the chocolate spot. The other site we had with PGRO was at Branston. There we had a bit more chocolate spot. We used those same timings and the same treatments that I referred to um, earlier on. So you've got the different, the different early timings compared with the later or standard T1, T2 timings. Again, looking for that information on whether or not we were better to go a bit earlier and what rate was um, uh, required for control. Now this is looking at um, chocolate spot and you can see here you've got the untreated. I'll put in some stats on this. Here you've got the standard two doses of Signum, T1 and T2. You've got the different rates of our um, uh, salatinol prothioconazole product and its Amistar so follow-up treatment. And here are the more standard timings, T1, T2. And I think from this, um, we could see that most of the treatments had worked very well. But we felt when we looked at this data, there was just an indication that um, rate flexibility in chocolate spot is not as good as it is in rust. Whereas in rust, we feel that you can go down the rates a little bit from the 0.6, which will be hopefully the approved rate. Um, and we think at the moment, based on fairly limited data, that that would not be such a good idea if you've got chocolate spot as your main pathogen. Just want to now illustrate one of our in-house trials. Again, same format um, as the ones we did with PGRO, but this one was done at uh, Grindale. Here, we've got two doses of Signum. We saw that the uh, very early application didn't work particularly well against um, the disease, uh, but the later or standard timings, the T1, T2 timing was extremely effective and the combination of using salatinol and prothio followed by amistar was as effective in disease control terms as using two doses of signum. And we saw here that um, the rate response was fairly, um, fairly flat. So you could get away on rust with down to the 0.4 rate in this particular trial. When you looked at that in terms of the crop yields, uh, again, we could see that uh, all of the treatments were just about statistically significant, different from uh, the untreated. Uh, and the best treatments in that trial were using the salatinol prothio at either the 0.6 rate or the 0.5 rate, and then following with that three quarters of a litre of Amistar, giving you the most ro robust delivery in terms of yield. And I calculated some uh, margin over fungicide costs um, for this. And you can see there that the margin over fungicide costs of the new product. So just to sort of try and recap on that um, uh, go through on the trials data, Important point, you can only use uh, the new product or only, you will only be able to use the new product once in the crop. So that's very different from those of you who've used Alter Elite in the past. Um, our recommendation is to use the uh, Salatinol Prothia based product at T1 and then to follow with Amistar at T2. That there is good rate flexibility for the Salatinol Prothia mixture um, if your main disease is rust. And as you've seen in that trial, we have shown some nice activity down to that 0.4 rate, uh, but to be safe, you're probably best to go at about a half a liter. Our data on chocolate spot is a bit more limited. And at the moment, we don't have enough to indicate that rate flexibility is a good idea on chocolate spot. So we'd be sticking with the idea of using the 0.6 rate um, and then following with Amistar if necessary. And this two spray program uh, we've shown is really outstanding against bean rust and will certainly perform better than using Signum at T1 and T2. And uh, we have shown good activity comparable to Signum at T1 and T2. If more chocolate spot to confirm that. Finally, just a quick uh, mention about a trial we did with PGRO on spring beans. Uh, we only did one trial last year on spring beans. We used the variety Lynx. It had very little chocolate spot in it, but it had a tremendous level of infection from rust. 
It wasn't a particularly good crop, so we weren't able to sensibly yield it. And we only had two timings, a T1, a standard T1 and T2 timing. In this experiment, um, you can see here, this is the uh, rust infection on the left-hand side here in the untreated. Uh, we did here as a standard, a signum followed by a straight tebuconazole, and those are the rates. And in this experiment, which was slightly different from the work we did in winter beans, we experimented to see which way around it was most effective to use our new product. Was it best to apply it before the amistar or after the amistar? So these two treatments here relate to using a selatinol prothia before amistar. And you can see there we've used it at a half a litre or 0.4 and then followed by three quarters of a litre or we've done it the other way around and put the amistar first and then followed with the um, selatinol prothio mixture. And as you can see here, this is a result we've seen previously that it's more effective to use uh, the selatinol prothio first and then follow with your amistar afterwards. So that's our sort of uh, thoughts about how best to use the product, um, generally speaking, and certainly in uh, spring beans. So again, we've shown a bit of rate flexibility on bean, bean rust, which tends to be the main disease in spring beans. Uh, we don't have uh, really strong data in spring beans on chocolate spot. So we would recommend not to go below half a litre and probably to stick to 0.6. So hopefully that gives you a feel uh, for the product, which um, uh, hopefully we will get that approval in time for use this season, but at least you've got some background information if it comes through and you can make decisions on uh, how to use it and when. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, if there are questions, I'm sure Rebecca will now give uh, Rebecca back the screen so that she can uh, deal with those questions. That's great, thank you, Michael. Just stop sharing for me, that'd be brilliant. I'm not quite sure why it's not doing it, Rebecca. Slight technical hitch here. It says it's not responding. I will take it quickly and then stop sharing. Okay, we'll carry on regardless. Um, so there are quite a number of questions um, that have come in. So we'll, we'll start from the top and work our way through. Um, question here on um, rotation. With all things being equal, how close can we stroke, should we keep the pulse rotation? Generally speaking, we say five years minimum. It depends a, bit, a little bit which crops we are talking about. Vining peas, for example, because the foot rods are a big problem there, we would say extend it a little bit. But um, generally speaking, five years for pulses works. And we have done some work on cover crops as well. And there's indications that legume species, particular, spe some specific legume species can be included in cover crops and they don't count towards the five years. Yeah. Um, so thinking about um, winter beans and chocolate spot, um, for forward crops of winter beans, which are already showing signs of chocolate spot, is early flowering, um, is early flowering for the first fungicide too late? And normally not. The, the only reason that you would go at early flowering is when you have really, really high levels of chocolate spot. And if the conditions are that it is um, forecast to be cool and humid, to really use for, for disease development, then you would add an early spray, um, a T0.5 basically. But in most cases, we have data to show that a three spray program is not beneficial. So it is only in severe chocolate spot uh, cases that you might consider going a little bit earlier. Okay, and still on um, chocolate spot, apparently there's quite a lot of um, chocolate spot already being seen in the early winter sown crops. Um, and the question around was what were the options for chocolate spot? 
I mean, obviously, you've just spoken there, Michael, um, about the potential option that's coming through from Syngenta. Um, what else could we be thinking about for Chocolate Spot? Well, uh, sorry, I'll let Leah answer the more general point. But yes, I'm sorry I lost you all there for a minute. Okay. I seem to get chucked out after I tried to uh, um, close my presentation. So apologies for that. Um, Yes, I mean, obviously, we're, we're confident that we'll have the product available, the selatinol based product available for this year. Um, so hopefully people will be inclined to give it a go. But in more general terms, uh, so Leah's covered the uh, products that are available in her presentation. So I'll, I'll leave her to comment on the more other more general options. With regards to chocolate spot, Signum works well, as does Amistar and or an Amistar tap combination. So all of these uh, switch also, but it's a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we've probably covered that one as we're going through. Um, so just thinking about uh, just jumping to rust. Um, at what growth stage is it no longer economic to keep rust out of the crop? At the end of a pot fill, basically, when all of the pots are full, then it is not necessary anymore. The, the, what you have to consider is that rust stops the photosynthetic activity of the plant. So if it completely defoliates uh, before the uh, pots are completely filled, before they start proper maturing, then it has an impact. But if you are getting rust in, when some of the um, lower pots especially are already mature, then um, it's not as economic anymore. Brilliant, thank you. Um, thinking about mildew, has any work um, been done with folia phosphite for downy mildew control? Um, I believe it's cleared in Germany. Yes, we have done a little bit of work with phosphites. Um, we have used it in two years and hopefully will repeat it this year. Um, there was one product in one of the years, FOS, which is a phosphate-based product, that did give um, significant control of being downy mildew. It didn't translate into yield in that case because the, the disease pressure wasn't that great, but the disease data alone, there was a significant reduction using FOS in comparison to anything else. Interesting. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions on the the new product, so I'll try and round them together, Michael. Um, so, firstly, can it be used on vining peas? Um, and then, why can't we have two applications of salatinol? Um, and have it, has it been compared against the seviconazole mixtures? Um, we won't unfortunately um, have a use on vining peas. We don't have um, the appropriate packages to support vining peas, only combining peas and dry peas. Uh, yes, you can compare it with um, the, the TEB and TEB is quite effective on rusts. I think where the big advantage of using this will come is where you have chocolate spot and possibly rust as well. So I think it's in those more sort of challenging uh, conditions, you'll need the sort of the higher, higher quality product. I think that was the questions that we were asked. <laughs> yeah, so I was just trying to look up the answer to uh, another question um, that's coming up, what, which still on salatinol, which is what will the harvest interval be for combining peas? Um, and I'm just looking at the draft label here and it says up to and including 20% of the pods have reached typical length. So that's approximately growth stage 72. Is the answer to that one. Um, someone's asked what the product will be called and I'm afraid that we cannot give that until we receive the um, official approvals from CRD. So you have to wait for that one, I'm afraid. Um, does Salatinol offer any downy mildew control? No, I, I don't think we're going to get useful control of downy mildew. Um, no. Um, and also, is there a possibility for the registration of vining peas and broad beans? Um, um, I think vining peas, no, 
broad beans is possibly more likely. But we, but I think we'd have to have an investigation into the, um, you know, the the residue data and the packages that support it, because obviously, you know, broad beans are eaten effectively raw, whereas uh, field beans are effectively dry. So I'm not quite sure whether we'd have enough data to cover that. But I think that's more likely than vining peas. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, which, which legume, um, which legumes are okay in cover crop mixes not to affect the five year rotation? I think, so you mentioned earlier, cover crop mixes affect that. Are there any that don't? Yeah, so we have done work in vining peas only, but um, and focusing on foot rot diseases. But I think we have enough data to carefully say that this would apply for all legume rotations. So their seam clover and winter vetch are fine. They didn't uh, show any impact on any of the diseases. On the contrary, they actually in some cases helped uh, the following pea crop. Based on literature searches, we can say that clovers are probably generally okay, that there are no overlaps that um, are of any concern. We would recommend to use winter veg rather than common veg because with common veg there's a slightly higher, it's probably still okay, but we, we just don't have enough data to say it is for sure uh, good to use. We would recommend to stay away from Lucerne because this has, an, especially prior to peas, because aphonomyces, which is a pathogen that affects peas, can also affect lucerne. And then with regards to pests, we would recommend to um, destroy the cover crops approximately six weeks prior to planting, so you don't have any put, uh, problems with potential slugs or weevil or bean seed fly. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's a question on, I'm going back to bean rust control, um, how would you compare tebuconazole to signum for bean rust control? Tebuconazole to signum? I don't think that we can really comment on that because that's neither of those are our products. I mean, I think we have shown very clearly in the trials we've done with PGRO and in-house that for rust control, the selatinol um, prothiol mixture really is absolutely top class um, and will be better than both of those materials. Leah, do you have any thoughts? Um, Sigmund is not the preferred product for rust control. Tebuconazole generally works a little bit better. Even BSF themselves say that uh, it's not the strength of the product. So I would recommend to go with Tebuconazole. Um, different disease foot rot um, how long do the spores survive in the soil? At least 10 years. Wow. A long time. That's a problem. <laughs> that is a long time. Um, another different disease, Cercospora. Um, is the Cercospora in beans and sugar beet the same species? No, it's not. It's two different ones. But it is that in sugar beet, we have see, they have seen it a little bit more over the last years as well. It really only became noticeable in beans about three to four years ago. It's a different species, but it might like the same condition. And this is maybe why we see it a little bit more frequent. I think this one's going back to Salatinol. Um, so it's asking, I'll try and combine a couple of questions here for Salatinol on peas. Um, how effective is it? Um, do we know what the strengths on peas are and also the timings in combining peas? Um, we I can't tell you the timings because um, I haven't put them down. Um, it may be on you if you've got the label there, um, Rebecca. But to be honest, we focused very much for this meeting for the... Um, field beans, because obviously we think that's where we've got the most data. There is data, obviously, within our biological assessment dossier for using combining peas. Um, and I think on the label there, it gives um, Ascochyta and what I can't remember the other disease was now on combining peas. You got that there, Rebecca? <laughs> combining peas, Ascochyta and... Rust, I think, was it? Yeah, rust. 
yeah. And I think it will have activity on other diseases as well, because I know that the amount of work done in combining peas is fairly limited, to be frank. It's just about enough, hopefully, to get through the approval. But certainly, I think people will be consider using it. I mean, it will be a useful um, additive to the uh, toolbox for uh, disease control. Going back to downy mildew, um, do we know if there are any um, foliar applied nutrition products that help towards downy mildew control? Um, from the limited work that we have done, the only one that had an, an impact on the levels of disease was in this one year, the product force. Nothing else actually reduced downy mildew infection from what we have tried. It doesn't mean that nutritional products will not generally help the um, overall health of the plants and the health of the plant, generally speaking, with all diseases, the, the better the plants are to, to cope with it. It's just we don't have any evidence that any specific product reduced disease pressure. Okay, um, thinking about um, AZ, oxystrobin, um, if you're using high rates of AZ at T2, um, have we got any information on whether this has delayed senescence um, and therefore later harvest compared to other options? I think we have got, I think it will, um, main, it could potentially maintain depending upon um, the level that you use, but I don't think it is really going to adversely affect the harvest, but I think we have, I think Simon did some work, did not, which showed a slight effect two years ago. Uh, before I can I, I can think back to one trial where there was definite um, extra greening with mm. the with the Amistar through the season, um, but I seem to recall that actually when it came to harvest and senescence, everything had had leveled yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that I think I think we just got a slight uplift in yield because of that extra greening, but it wasn't mm. it wasn't a significant difference in the harvest dates. So I do remember, yeah, yeah. Um, is it possible for foot rot to develop in dry, droughty conditions? Maya? No, if it's a complete drought and really dry, no, because the foot rots do need some water to establish. The problem is in 2020, we had a really, really strong foot rot uh, year in beans, and it was a little bit difficult to explain because we had the drought to start with, and you would have thought it would have taking it down, but I think because the plants were stressed due to the drought, and then we had some water come in, mm. for whatever reason, it did develop into much higher levels than I would have expected. So no drought on its own does unfortunately not protect from foot rot completely. Unfortunate things, we seem to be moving more in, in that way around that timing. But. Um, there's a question around chocolate spot control um, that usually the, the earliest timings for chocolate spot products is, is often flowering. So are there now any, will there be any potential legal options that can be applied post that, well, pre that flowering um, period? There is no need to apply pre flowering in most cases. There is no advantage because in the levels of the disease are in most cases so low that applying anything that early doesn't translate into any benefits. So I would say the, the normal timings that we say mid flower, early flower sometimes under the extreme disease pressure, but otherwise, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, I think, I think our trials this year, I know we didn't get as much data on chocolate spot as we hoped to get because of the season, but I think the trials indicate that that, that is the case, yes. Um, do we have any issues with Amistar being used on its own from a resistance point of view? The FRAC think... guidelines... Sorry, Michael. No, go ahead, Charlie. The FRAC guidelines state that if you're using Amistar twice in a season, you have to add a product um, in the second application. So if you're only using it once, you can use it on its own. But generally speaking, Amistar and TEP go quite well together. So if you have the option to mix then for, from a resistant point of view, that would be advantageous, but it, legally you can use it on its own once. 
Yeah, and as you see from the programs that we were suggesting, it was only one application of Amistar at the end at the T2 timing. Um, has there been any disease resistance seen in triazoles or SDHI chemistry um, in legumes as has been seen in cereals? Not as far as I'm aware. Um, I don't know whether Lee had any further experience, but no, I think the answer to that is no, as best we know at the moment. No, as best as I know as well, there's no proper resistance development in anything. Okay, um, with, yeah, anticipating that this question would more than likely come through. Um, can we explain a bit more about the situation with methylaxyl MC treatment? A decision in April is too late for making decisions this year. Um, some seed companies have advised us, okay, some not. There is no advice on your website. Okay, so the situation is quite complicated um, with methylaxyl M. Um, that's an active ingredient that I look after for Syngenta. Um, and at the minute, we're working very hard with CRD to see what we can do here. Um, I actually had a, another meeting about this at, at eight o'clock this morning. And at the moment, CRD are adamant that they are going to stick to the 1st of June restriction. Um, I have, we're having several discussions with them about this um, because we believe things are being treated a little unfairly um, and the messages that we're getting from them are not consistent. We're also making them fully aware that the industry is very confused at the moment um, because they're not actually signalling this information on any of their websites or anything um, which is obviously not helping growers plan and the 1st of June is not very far away from people purchasing seed and things. So I think uh, all I can ask at the moment is that, that people are patient. This is really the conversations and decisions are really ramping up at the moment um, and we hope that there'll be more information shortly. But as we sit here at the minute, the outdoor sowing restriction stands as of the 1st of June. Um, and we'll give you more information as and when we can. Mm. So other questions that we have through, um, are biofumigant cover crops helpful in soil borne diseases? I don't know much about biofumigants in uh, legumes, to be honest, uh, more my experiences in potatoes. I don't know whether Leah, you can comment on that. Um, we haven't done any proper biofumigation experiment with regards to diseases in field beans, but we have a PhD student together with Harper Adams who has done biofumigation using um, different mustard types for stem nematode control, which is an important mm -hmm. pest in field beans. And uh, he is writing up the thesis at the moment, so the final results will come to us um, probably within the next few months, but there is as Becky said yesterday in her presentation, indication that um, one of the masters, I think it was Brassica Jungia, actually did reduce the numbers of stem nematodes in soil. Okay, just switching um, crop quickly to, to peas, um, if we know anything about those. Can you briefly comment on powdery mildew control in, um, in peas? Um, or whether or not we think we'll have any effect with the uh, new product. I, I would think with the... No, no, I think it's, I think it's just generally how do you mildew control in peace? I think, I'm not sure. Different well, I, I'll just say, it, uh, I'll, I'll pass back to Lee in a second, but I would expect that we would get some activity um, against it from the salatinol component and the prothyra as well, probably. But more generally, I'd ask uh, Lea to comment on her experience with, uh, with powdery mildew. The currently approved uh, product that we would recommend was sulfur. So um, uh, Sioprone is the new liquid formulation of sulfur, which will hopefully be available for this season. This worked well, but because powdery mildew is increasingly a problem in both vining and in combining peas, we are hoping to do some levy work this year to look at other products that are improved approved in common binding piece, just not for powdery mildew, to see whether there's anything, um, and maybe we can include the new product if it is um, 
improved in time as well to see because yes there is a need to for, for part of media control but so far so far works the best perfect thank you Leah. um just going back to foot rock quickly there's a the last couple of questions um how do foot rot spores travel between fields and if you've had a bad foot rot year would you avoid growing beans in an adjacent field the following year you, you have to avoid the field that was infected for at least 10 years because of the long lasting ones. They, they don't travel by itself. The, the way that they are moved from field to field is by machinery. So this is the problem. Um, it is very difficult because the, the, you only need a very small amount of soil basically being transported from one field to the other to transport the footwood soils as well. So if you know that you have an infected field, really take care of your machine hygiene. And if you don't transport any soil from A to B, then the field next door is fine. Brilliant, thank you. Good tips, Leah. Um, question here, have we got any concerns about the widespread use of prothiconazole in arable rotation across both cereals and all seed rape? and now pulses. Uh, have we got any concerns? Um, is that particularly to do with resistance or? I would assume it's resistance, yeah. Well, at least in uh, by using products in combination, as we are with the proposed new product with salatinol and prothia, that reduces um, the resistance risk quite considerably. Um, more generally, whether or not there is any um, risk or evidence of um, accumulation, I, I don't know. I'm not in a position to answer that. I would think it's unlikely, to be honest. But I think the main no, risk would be that you, you could get overexposure to certain pathogens. But I, I think the only way around that is either to reduce use or use it in combination wherever you reasonably can. And obviously, we're, we're coming forward with a, a co-form to, to mitigate that risk. And thinking about that, that co-form, um, is, um, is, is, is T1 um, the best timing or the most effective timing for rust? Is that the best timing for application for rust, T1? I mean, I think it will depend a bit on what happens in each individual season. You know, from the work we did uh, with PGRO this year, it was effective. But as you saw, we, we, we went in um, the winter bean trials with the two spray program with the salatinol prothia mixture to start off with at the T1 timing or slightly earlier in some cases. Um, and, and then Amistar at the, uh, the T2. So yeah, we believe it's the right way around of doing it because um, both of those products will have activity against the rust. But from our experience and from, from the uh, trials that we did for, for you as well, a T1 alone would normally not be enough for us because rust is coming in later. So this is why we say, generally speaking, a T2 is required for, for rust control. Yes, a good point. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the very last question from, um, from the boss, Roger Vickers himself. So metal axle um, cut off in June doesn't give growers um, reasonable opportunity to dispose of all seed in 2021, a CRD considering this. Um, so yeah, in answer to that, that's one of the things that we're, we're working with them on at the moment, that if they are adamant that they are going to put the EU regulation into place, um, that that isn't a decent use up period for people. Um, and that's something that we're, we're discussing with them at the minute. Thank you very much, Leah, Michael. That's, uh, we've got to the end of all the, um, the questions there. Really good amount of questions that came in. So all that leaves me to do is say thank you very much, Michael, Leah. Thank you very much to everyone that's joined us. We hope you, that you've enjoyed the event. Uh, just a reminder that you will receive an email tomorrow to be able to claim your basis and Neuroso points. Um, and that will also have a survey link in, which we'd love to hear from you from. We have our fourth and final webinar tomorrow um, on herbicides. So please join us um, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.